To outwit you and all your tricks, a person or a god would need to be an expert at deceit. You clever rascal. So duplicitous, so talented at lying. You love fiction and tricks so deeply, you refuse to stop even in your own land. Yes, both of us are smart. No man can plan and talk like you, and I am known among the gods for insight and craftiness. You fail to recognize me. I am Athena, child of Zeus. I always stand near you and take care of you in all your hardships. Hello and welcome once again to The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And this time we are reading Homer's Odyssey, and we're going to be looking particularly at Emily Wilson's translation of it. Which is a new beginning. We started with Homer's Iliad, and so now here we are at the Odyssey, which is sort of bookending what we've been doing so far in these conversations. Well, we'll talk about that in a moment, but first, we have a little bit of news. I think we never actually mentioned, but a while back, you were a guest on another megaphonic podcast called This Is Your Mixtape. Yeah, just a couple of weeks ago. That was super fun. I really enjoyed doing that with Michael Collins. Yeah, so for those listeners who haven't heard it, it is a show in which Michael asks a guest, somebody interesting, to pick five songs from five different periods of their life. And they talk about the songs, they talk about the life, they talk about all sorts of things. And I learned quite a bit about you from listening to that episode. It was really compelling. Well, it was a really fascinating thing to do, right? Because, how can I put it? We remember our past, but we don't sort of consciously remember our past. Like, unless there's an occasion to retell a story, you just don't. And so even if you've known somebody for a long time, these stories don't come out unless there's a reason for them to be told. And also, I got to learn a few new songs, which was terrific as well. So uh, we'll have a link in the show notes for that, but go listen to it. It's really great. Also, another weird thing happened. After our last episode on The Tempest came out, there was a bit of conversation in the Slack group that anybody who supports us or any of the other Megaphonic shows, go to patreon.com slash Megaphonic if you want to join us in that Slack. But we had a conversation about The Tempest, and we talked a bit, and it led to some very silly jokes, as often happens. And that eventually led to us making some t-shirts. It's a very regenerative podcast, I have to say. It's really, it was really strange, but it was delightful. So we have some very silly t-shirts up for sale, uh, one of which has the full Fathom 5 quote on it in a very sort of vaporwave 90s Dixie cup looking geometric background. (laughs) And another one has something that isn't quite the full Fathom 5 quote. You can choose which of those you'd like, or you can get both of them, or you can do whatever you want. But uh, we just thought we'd let you know about it. The second version is very meta. It's it's definitely meta and definitely something you might have to explain to people, but that's what t-shirts are for, I guess. So as you said, this is a throwback, a follow-up, a part two in a way to the very first text that we looked at, the Iliad, which is also attributed to Homer. There is, of course, as always, some complication around the simple attribution of these two poems, these two epic poems to Homer in as much as there may or may not have been anything like an actual Homer person who composed either of them. And in fact, they might not have been composed by the same people, by the same forces, writing it as a follow-up to the other one in that way that an author who writes a sequel to their, you know, it's not J.K. Yeah, Rowling yeah. putting out the next Harry Potter book. Yeah, no, it's actually, it's a, I was just thinking about this as you were talking. It's a really interesting question, you know, because, I mean, they're both attributed to Homer, so this poet from antiquity, they date from around seven centuries BCE. They clearly emerge from the same cultural environment. They both emerge as oral poems, both the Iliad and the Odyssey, that take on written form. They take on that written form around, you know, probably around the seventh century BCE. And uh, if they're not by the same poet, they're emerging from the same or very close poetic context, right? Like the same cultural environment. But what gives them their form and gives them the ground on which we tend to compare them comes, I think, less from that 7th century oral story origin than it does from when these were codified. We talked a little bit when we did the Iliad about this moment around the 2nd or 3rd century in the Common Era, AD, where in Alexandria and around Alexandria in what's now northern Egypt, you have sort of schools of commentary and explication of these texts. And they read Homer really seriously, both the Iliad and the Odyssey. And that's where we get the 24 book structure that we find in both of those works. And so the form of the poems, like, especially when we talk about things like symmetries or like the shape of the narrative, uh, they're, they're shaped in that same cultural environment. So um, in some ways, they're twin texts because they both come out of this, you know, ancient oral culture. But in some ways, they're twin texts because they come out of a kind of a codification moment in commentaries. 
which I think is really interesting. I find that fascinating. I guess a lot of people who learn about Homer go through several stages. First off, thinking Homer was a person who wrote two really long poems that became very famous. And then maybe learning that, well, maybe it was sort of more of an oral culture thing and maybe it was and attributed to this. So maybe it's like a similar set of forces. But this third stage of where you think of it as, no, it's more of a way of reading, like a mm-hmm. tradition of interpretation. That's right. That strikes me as really fascinating that that is how these two texts have been lumped together. I mean, they were already attributed to the same author before you get to the Alexandrian context, but but the strengthening of that relationship, that's definitely coming out of there. Well, so we should talk a little bit about how these two texts relate to each other. Yeah. And also maybe sort of laying out a little bit about the Odyssey itself, which I always feel it's a little bit like what we faced when we were talking about Shakespeare last time, where like everybody has heard of the Odyssey, right? Or the idea of an Odyssey, like there's the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, like to say something is an Odyssey, that's a pretty common term. So they might not know the whole plot of the work, but they have an idea of Odyssey. And that's kind of interesting. Like that's ubiquitous. Yeah. I think we think of an Odyssey as a a journey and a particularly arduous journey with lots of adventures along the way. And obviously that's coming out of this text, but it's interesting to both think about how the actual text does and doesn't reflect that. Yeah. Just like we talked about how the Iliad, while we think of it as as a poem about the Trojan War, it in fact covers just a small sliver of the war and isn't always focused on the war itself, but more about the interpersonal dynamics that emerge from that intense state of being under siege or sieging a place. Yeah. And the Iliad, you know, being about Ilias, you know, being about Troy. Um, so it's the story of a city and the de- the story of the death of a city, right? That's unfolded through the participants in the siege, both inside the city and outside the city walls. And in the Odyssey, it means the story of a man, right? So it's, it's the focus is, it, there's a lot of parallelism, but the focus is different in a really interesting way. Well, let me go over the basic plot of the Odyssey, just in case anyone isn't familiar with it. So, we have Odysseus, who is the infamously clever king of Ithaca, and he's left his wife and infant son behind to go fight in the Trojan War, as we saw in the Iliad, which lasted 10 years, and which was only won once Odysseus came up with a sneaky plan to hide some soldiers inside a big wooden horse. You've presumably heard about the Trojan horse thing. But after the fall of Troy, the gods prevent Odysseus from getting home quickly, and so it takes him another 10 years to get back home to Ithaca. And during those years, he and his men travel from island to island and encounter unfamiliar peoples and dangerous monsters and demanding gods. (laughs) But it's not all travel, though. The goddess Calypso, for example, falls in love with Odysseus and forces him to stay on her island for seven years. But... Most of Odysseus' adventures involve the death of more and more of his men, and by the time he finally gets back to Ithaca, all of his men have died. Now, before he gets back to Ithaca, nobody back home knows whether Odysseus is dead or alive. But it's been about ten years, and so most people assume he isn't coming back. And so, more and more suitors have come looking to marry Odysseus' wife, Penelope. Now, she's also clever. She's figured out ways of delaying having to choose a suitor, having to get married, having to make that decision. But they've caught on to her, and they're eating her out of house and home. And they're demanding more and more that she make that decision. Odysseus' son, Telemachus, who's now about 20, tries to assert himself over the suitors and also over his mother, but with limited success. And with the guidance of Athena, he sneaks off to visit neighboring lands to find out news about his father. And while he's away, that's when Odysseus arrives back in Ithaca. And Athena, his patron goddess, disguises him as an old man. And once Telemachus returns, they all devise a plan to take care of the suitors. So Odysseus pretends to be a beggar, a guest who's in need of aid, and he connives to lock the suitors into a dining hall after removing all the weapons. And then... They slaughter the suitors, along with some faithless slaves in the household. It's like a Tarantino movie. It's quite (laughs) dramatic and bloody. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's really over the top. And Odysseus finally reunites with Penelope. They get to spend one lovely night together. Uh, But then the rest of the Ithacans arrive to gather the bodies of their relatives, you know, the suitors who've just been killed, and they all begin to plot their revenge against King Odysseus. But after a few little scraps, Athena intervenes and declares that no, all this fighting has to end. And that's where the poem ends. Now, that's not the order which the poem tells these stories. Yeah, we get backstory. Yeah, we start sort of in the middle of it. We start with Odysseus at Calypso trying to finally leave. Well, sort of, right? Because we, 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 we don't actually get him in the action until book five, right? Out of the 24 books. 
In, right. in the opening books, we're kind of more in Ithaca, right? With Telemachus and Penelope. Yes, he's mentioned briefly in book one, but but we quickly cut over to Telemachus and Penelope and what's happening there. Which is an interesting move, right? If this poem was supposedly about this guy, we get him up front so we know that we're going to hear about him, but we don't embark upon his adventure, so to speak, until like a ways in, which is a weird and fascinating move. You got to wonder why that is. Well, and even when we embark upon his adventure, we're sort of in the middle of it. And then we hear a little bit about the past Mm -hmm. and then he has some adventures and then we hear a bit more. And then he arrives someplace where he has to tell the story of what he's been doing. And that's when we find out everything that's happened since he left Troy and we hear about the horse and we, all that stuff. Like it's told in this back and forth kind of way where quite a lot of it gets to be Odysseus reciting the stories to other people rather than the narrator telling us about it. But it's very much not in chronological order up until he returns home to Ithaca. That's right. And there are a few flashbacks after that point, but for the most part, that point, which is about halfway through the poem, onwards, is all about this plotting to kill the suitors and and reunite the family. To resolve the conflict that's emerged in Ithaca. Or almost to think about lifting the siege, you know, on Penelope. I was thinking about that this time. I never thought about it before. You know, the Iliad is about the siege of a city, right? It's this period of time during the 10 years of the war, right? And this is, in a, in a funny kind of way, I mean, it's almost like Penelope's besieged by the suitors, right? It's a very different kind of narrative in many ways, but that sense that there's this tension around a focal point, there's an interesting parallel there. I was struck by that. Are there Are there any other ways that you find them interestingly different? I find them so different because, you know, there's many different ways, but one that was really sticking out to me, and I was thinking about this like in the shower earlier today, (laughs) is, you know, the gods. You remember when we were reading the Iliad, the gods are constantly involved. They're constantly like interacting and interceding. And there's almost like this multiple levels of interaction that's happening when we're in the Iliad, where there's the world of men and there's the world of the gods and stuff happens in each one of these worlds. And every now and then you have a crossover moment where one of the gods pops down or, you know, Mars is on the battlefield or Poseidon is doing this or whatever. Here, Athena appears a number of times and we we get a little glimpse now and then of Poseidon being irritated with Odysseus or Zeus, you know, weighing in on something, but not nearly as much as we saw in the Iliad. And so this is much more a world of human beings. Uh, and that struck me as really different and because it made me then think about, well, what's taking the place of what the divine was doing in the Iliad? And and I wonder about that. I mean, do you, does that something that struck you too? I was thinking about like, what's taking up the space that the gods were taking up in that other book? It did strike me. One of the interesting things uh, sort of aligned with that is that when certain gods show up, Calypso, Circe, they're playing a very different role. They're much yeah. more like very fancy people. Yeah, yeah. Because they're not like the major Olympian gods, right? right? Yeah. And they both stay on their islands and they both they both fall in love with the mortal, but it's not like the stories we've heard of Zeus who, you know, goes down to rape somebody and then leave. Like they want him to stay. They want to basically have a kind of marriage Mm -hmm. with Odysseus. And there are clear limitations on their power. I mean, every god is limited to some extent, uh, except for Zeus, right? That was virtually unlimited. But but, but these figures, um, like Circe, like Calypso, they're divine, but within that spectrum of humanity and divinity, they're closer to humanity in some ways. They interact with them in a different kind of way, different kind of footing. So that's really interesting. The other thing that strikes me as being perhaps taking up a little bit of that space that the gods take up is cleverness. You know, in the Iliad, we see cleverness and ingenuity a little bit, particularly through the character of Odysseus himself, right? Who's quite manipulative, you know, when we see him those couple occasions in the um, Iliad. But here, there's more that a number of people are clever. It's a quality that Odysseus has, you know, in abundance. He shares it with Athena. And the, that's, and we might talk about their relationship, about that relationship between Odysseus and Athena. Part of it is that shared cleverness that we called out in the passage we began with. Um, but also Penelope has got a kind of, not exactly the same language is used to describe her, but in her subterfuge that keeps the suitors away, she's weaving an elaborate tapestry. And she, every night she undoes the weaving she's done during the day in order to hold off the time when she's going to have to give an answer to the suitors. And if Eventually, she gets caught out in the subterfuge and she has to actually finish the, the, the weaving that she's been doing. Also, when she encounters Odysseus near the end of the narrative, she's also like clever and circumspect, right? So human intelligence and ingenuity seems to be doing an odd kind of work. Like it's not divine exactly, but it's it's present. In, and like, for example, we get the account of the Trojan horse here, right? Which we don't get in the Iliad. It's about the story of the fall of Troy, this business with the Trojan horse, but it doesn't show up in the Iliad. It shows up here in the Odyssey as part of the remembering of that history. And that, above all, is about like trickiness and creativity and 
how, how can I put it, how human ingenuity can be a force for good in the sense that it can serve you and your companions, but it also can destroy others. So that takes up a lot of headspace, I think, in the Odyssey. Well, and indeed, famously, the opening line of the Odyssey, uh, which I will not attempt to read in Greek, but it's translated in the Emily Wilson translation that we're working with today as, tell me about a complicated man. And the word for complicated is a famously difficult to translate word. It's polytropos, which literally translates into many turning or much traveled, or there's a few different ways that that like can Like very literally, mean. like many turning, many turns, right? Many That's turns. The, the most literal level of it, right? But then what that means... What that means is, yeah. is, is interesting. And in modern Greek, that has come to mean cunning or crafty, the same way that we un- normally understand it of Odysseus. But I'm also thinking about that many turning and, and, and ways that that echoes throughout it. For example, as you were just describing, one of the ways that Penelope is thought of as clever is through her weaving, which is, of course, a way of much turning. Turning and unturning, right? Like, in other words, you, you move the spindle through the warp, right? You know, and you turn as you go back and forth, row by row, right? Literally, right? And then she undoes it, right? So, like, on some literal level, that is exactly what she's doing. She's turning and unturning. Yeah. And then you can play it out as well that, you know, with regard to Odysseus, I guess, more specifically, is it that he's got this cunning crafty, many turning kind of mind? Or is he turned many times? Like in other words, when we talk about his journey and how circuitous it is and how he goes here and here and here, is it describing what happens to him or is it describing him, like this intrinsic quality? Um, So that is really weird. And when you start looking at the translations, they vary a lot in how they deal with that, which is really interesting. Yeah. But what is at least uh, unanimous is that every translator's note and translator's introduction points that out. Yeah. And you know, you get a whole bunch of different kinds of phrases that account for Odysseus's quality of mind that pick up on that many turning, many turns of the opening line. Elsewhere in Wilson's translation, she gives it as many minded, but other accounts of Odysseus's intellectual qualities say this. Um, in book seven, he said to plan his words with careful skill. Uh, at another moment in book eight, he tied a cunning knot that he had learned from Circe. And this idea of tying a knot, right? Again, I like Penelope's weaving. It's like a really interesting metaphor embedded there. Like literally he's tying a knot, but it's how can I put it? He does this metaphorically and intellectually as well. There's just a whole range of languages. You sometimes quite negative and sometimes very positive, right? But always twisty. Yes. I, it, cleverness itself is many turning. Like it can it can solve your problems and it can cause your problems. Yeah. Your your cleverness can not necessarily backfire, but it can have unintended consequences. Oh, I mean, some of this is because Odysseus is a very proud person when th- there's a famous sequence where he's very clever and tricks the Cyclops. When the Cyclops asks him his name, he says his name is effectively uh, no one or no name. No man. Yeah. And so later on, after the, they've attacked and blinded the Cyclops, he shouts out to his, to his fellows. No man is torturing me. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, oh, oh they're yeah. like, yeah, no man is torturing you, I bet. And they stay home and they don't help them. And it's like, oh, but at the end of that encounter, as he's leaving, he says, oh, by the way, my name's not No Man, it's Odysseus. This allows Poseidon to hear about what has happened, to know who caused it, and to cause him further delays in getting home. So, Yeah, because Odysseus did not realize that the um, Cyclops he was torturing was the son of Poseidon, and that's what defers his trip home. Yeah, um, Odysseus actually kind of draws our attention to, I guess, the justification of this wiliness, of this craftiness. This one moment in Book 9 where he says, he's talking about himself, he says, I was strategizing, hatching plans so that my men and I could all survive. I wove all kinds of wiles and cunning schemes. Danger was near, and it was life or death. So on the one hand, he kind of excuses this cunningness, this wiliness in terms of necessity. Like I had to do it to save myself, to save my men. But you also get the sense, tell me if you got this impression too, that he takes this pleasure in this quality. And uh, Athena takes a pleasure in this quality. You rascal, remember in that opening? Oh, right? yes. She, she, she likes that in him. Um, so on the one hand, it's kind of justified, oh, I had to do it. But it's also like this like pleasure in, in craftiness, this pleasure in wiliness, which I know we shouldn't really like, but it is kind of likable. It's, it's fun engaging. to read about, certainly. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. That is why Athena is Odysseus's patron, because she enjoys his cleverness, that it is almost godlike. Mm. Uh, and, it, and she, of course, is also a very clever god. Mm. So, so she has a particular delight in that and a particular interest in nurturing the clever human. And it's a different way of getting glory, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. usually you expect that uh, Achilles, well, for Well, compare example, Achilles, I was just yeah, going to say. In the Iliad, he's going to get glory by fighting, by killing, by these very direct, blunt measures. 
And while they do show that he is you know, more complicated than just killing in terms of his emotional state and his connection with people and his motivations, that's very different from Odysseus coming up with the clever ruse of, of sneaking people into the Trojan horse. Totally different. Totally different, right? But what's really fascinating is that then you do get Odysseus in that sort of almost Achilles-like position of carrying out bloodshed near the end of the Odyssey. But the fundamental difference, I think this is super important, is that Telemachus is there with him, right? It's a father and a son. And that father-son relationship, both between Odysseus and Telemachus throughout that whole second half of the of the book, but also when Odysseus encounters his own father in the very last book, that's a whole thing that's going on there that's really different from the heroism of Achilles back in the, um, the Iliad. I mean, not that fathers and sons weren't important there, but a very different kind of way. Like in the Iliad, it was more about that we heard more about the whole father-son dynamic on the Trojan side. Here, we're getting that um, folded into the Greek hero in a really creepy kind of way, I think, in some ways. Well, well, creepy how do you... Well, I'm thinking about the scenes of bloodshed and violence. In other words, Telemachus kind of grows up. He becomes a man. And the way he becomes a man is by carrying out savage acts even more violent than what his father proposed to do. And that's what makes him a man. Mm. I find that super creepy. Like, I don't, like, I always, I'm on the fence here, I don't want to give away too much of what happens. But on the other hand, like, you know, so Odysseus comes home. That's a like, spoiler alert. Odysseus comes home. And we know that there's a violent scene when order is kind of restored. But the nature of that scene bears looking at. So after the slaughter of the suitors takes place and Odysseus and Telemachus together have like carried this out, they make the slave girls of the household clean it up. So that's pretty hideous, right? Um, this is not Odysseus speaking, but Telemachus. He speaks winged words to them. He says to the female slaves, now we must start to clear the corpses out. The girls must help. Then clean my stately chairs and handsome tables with sponges fine as honeycomb and water. And then he says, Take out the girls between the courtyard wall and the rotunda, hack at them with long swords, eradicate all life from them. They will forget the things the suitors made them do with them in secret. And the girls sob, carry out the bodies of the dead, pile them up, clean. Right? There's this long process where they know they're going to be slaughtered and they're cleaning up. And then Telemachus, showing initiative, he says, I refuse to grant these girls a clean death since they poured down shame on me and mother when they lay beside the suitors. At that, he wound a piece of sailor's rope around the rotunda and round the mighty pillar, stretched up so high no foot could touch the ground. As doves or thrushes spread their wings to fly home to their nests, but someone sets a trap. They crash into a net, a bitter bedtime. Just so the girls, their heads all in a row, were strung up with the noose around their necks to make their death in agony. They gasped, feet twitching for a while, but not for long. I was, I was like, wow. And that's something Wilson's translation does, I think, incredibly well. It gives you the the raw painfulness of that scene. And and that's what makes Telemachus a man. You know, it, he takes the most savage acts that take place, the things that strike us as most horrid, right? It's not Odysseus doing these, it's Telemachus. And 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 I think we're we're meant to understand this as like, okay, now that's what makes him a man. That's what makes him mature. I mean, so a lot of the book, especially the early section, is really focused on this question of Telemachus not performing properly the duties of being a man, even though he is of age. Well, he's sort of on the threshold, right? Well, he's on the threshold, but there's also a sense that if that father figure had been around, mm. he would be closer to fulfilling his duties as a man. Because it's not just about years, right? It's not just about age. It's also about that relationship of father and son, about being kind of brought into manhood, right? Um, so this happens in a very deferred way for Telemachus, I think. Right. And it's being deferred both by the lack of a father around. It's also being deferred because these suitors are here. And if these suitors take over, if one of these suitors marries Penelope, what's going to happen to Telemachus? Mm -hmm. It's not like he gets adopted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, he gets mm -hmm. cast out on his own. Yeah, I kept thinking about Hamlet. Yes. <laughs> right? Not quite the same, but mm, interesting to think about. So there's definitely one thread throughout the poem about how Telemachus is not properly fulfilling the roles expected of him as a as a full-grown man, as an adult in this society. Mm. And he goes on his own little odyssey to meet up with different local kings and, and find out news about his father, but also get some advice from sympathetic men who are not just trying to marry away the wealth of his mother. Mm -hmm. Now, how possible do you think this reading that I'm going to offer right now is? Mm. Is it possible that Telemachus in that scene is still not quite doing it right? He's mm. gone too far. Mm -hmm. The the poem sort of drops it yeah. after this. Like yeah. Telemachus doesn't really come back up again yeah. after he's killed these slaves. 
not in any serious way. So we don't get any sense of like, we get the, we get the, the reuniting scene with Odysseus and Penelope. We get the scene with Odysseus mm-hmm. and his father mm-hmm. and then the rest of town. Yeah. But we don't get a response by Odysseus to what Telemachus has done. Yeah. There's no sort of culminating no, scene there. No, no. That is interesting, right? And the question is, like you said, whether he's done what he's supposed to do or has he gone too far? And Odysseus doesn't respond. So we don't know yeah. what the judgment might be. We don't know whether the poem is in, is suggesting that the 20-year absence of his father is solved so easily with one grand gesture. So Odysseus, at the end, returns home. And there is a lovely scene where he meets up with Penelope again, and Penelope and Odysseus sort of test each other to make sure that they are who they say they are, I suppose, but also that you know Penelope has been true all this time, which she has, and and then they then they spend the night together, they have sex, and then they talk for ages about everything that's happened, and it's this very warm scene, uh-huh. and feels a bit like it is the moment we've been waiting for, where we've returned home, but it is not the end of the poem, no, and it it can be questioned perhaps whether this is the homecoming that we might think it should be. Well, there's so much to say about that. You know, I think we're conditioned partly from having, you know, grown up in an age where the novel is the standard. It's in the air we breathe, it's in the water we swim in, right? We're conditioned to, I think, understand that moment of conjugal reunion, you know, with your love partner as the climactic moment. And it is a really powerful moment. But I think that it's also part of a sequence of moments that we're meant to understand as kind of pressing on this idea of home and reunion and a kind of a moment of wholeness that comes from knowing yourself, knowing where you are, knowing who you're with, you know, and there's a whole range of moments that lead towards, and Penelope is a really important, that moment with Penelope or that period of time with Penelope is a really important one. But the reunion with his father, I think, is, I think we're meant to see that as as even more climactic in some really profound way in terms of what's happening in terms of time. So in order to see how that unfolds, I think you have to kind of back up to some of the earlier moments where there's ideas about home and yearning for home. Like it starts pretty early on, like in the first half of the Odyssey. For example, when Odysseus is talking about his adventures and he's talking about his time with Circe, she had encouraged him to stay with her. And and he said, but I, I wouldn't. She never swayed my heart. He said, since when a man is far from home living abroad, there is no sweeter thing than his own native land and family. Right? So he's yearning for this return, even at this very early stage. Um, and then also, uh, just a little bit later, he's talking about how he's lost some of his men who stay behind during the period of the adventures. And he says they'd forgotten home. Right? So he, he has to kind of forcibly take them along because they've forgotten about where they need to go. They need to return. And so for Odysseus, this is something he talks about, but it also like it gets expressed in these very like physical, tangible terms. This is one moment that um, I think it'd be really interesting to talk about if we talk about like wateriness a little bit more later. When he finally finds himself in Ithaca, he doesn't even know where he is at first. He's got this yearning for home that's been driving him all along, but he doesn't even recognize it initially when he's there. So there's a whole series of these moments, and then that encounter with Penelope where they come to recognize one another, the moment with his father. These are all part of a sequence, I think. Um, And when each person recognizes him, it's something different. With the old nurse that's washing his feet and legs, remember what it is that tells him? Yes. No, he's he's, he's got a scar that he had acquired long, long ago. Yeah, as a child, right? As a a very, very young man, right? And it's it's a really creepy moment, I think, because he doesn't intend to be recognized. And it's really important for his plan that he not be recognized. And she's washing him. She feels the scar. And she looks at him and he grabs her by the throat because you can't tell. And this is this is the nurse who was his wet nurse and that he's had this long and intimate relationship with yeah. and suddenly he becomes very violent towards her. Yeah. Um, and so that's a, that's an odd, strange moment of a tremendous intimacy, right? Because it's a recognition moment, but it's also a moment where like violence is right there on the threshold. Um, it's a recognition that it's not time for. As opposed to these other recognition scenes, when the recognition with Penelope finally happens, and we should sort of unpack that, um, it's one that we've we've waited for. It's time for that recognition to happen. And the one with his father as well is where it's time for it to happen. So with the Penelope scene, it's not a scar, right? It's not any physical feature of the body, it's shared knowledge. And she does this in a very tricky way. Well, they're about to head into the bed for some intimacy, and she makes a little joke about how the bed has been moved. Yeah, well, from she's, their like, she's like, oh, I'll arrange. Let me just see if I can find the passage because it's so great. 
um, she's saying, oh, I'm like, I'm really happy to see you. She said um, to her, one of her slave women, she says, make the bed up for him outside the room he built himself. Pull out the bedstead and spread quilts and blankets on it. She spoke to test him. And Odysseus is furious because, he says, who moved my bed? It would be difficult for even a master craftsman. No man, however young and strong, could pry it out. There's a trick to how this bed was made. I made it, no one else. Uh, There used to be a tree there, an olive tree. He says, I built the room around it. I packed stones together and fitted a roof. I trimmed the olive tree and used my bronze to cut the branches off and planed it down and transformed the trunk into a bedpost. And then I made the other three inlaid with gold and silver and ivory. And he goes on to describe how exactly he made this bed. It's immovable because it's anchored by this living tree, right? And he's so angry. He says, now I've told the secret trick, but woman, wife, I do not know if someone, a man, has cut the olive trunk and moved my bed or if it's still safe. So he's incredibly angry. And of course, she's, she's just, she knows now. Right, um, and so it's so it's a, it's a very climactic kind of scene, and it's but it's weirdly symbolic. Like, what is it to build your bed around a tree? To build your house around the bed? It's this weird, I don't know what to call it, like a vortex or a black hole or a center of gravity in a weird kind. Of, it struck me as such a weird and powerful thing. I don't know what to make of it. Well, it's interesting too to decide whether he would have built the bed because of the beauty of that idea of having their relationship be so firmly planted to the ground and and, and stable, or whether he did that because it would be useful for a trick and testing yeah, someday. Yeah, well, he's that kind of guy, right? Right. Like, he, did he was he playing the long game that sometime like, he might have to test his wife's fidelity, and, he, <laughs> and because nobody else should be allowed into the bedroom. No, that's so if right. Anybody else knows about this clever life hack that he's done, yeah, then yeah. then he knows that she's been unfaithful. Yeah. And that seems, from our perspective, kind of terrible as well. Yeah, I know. That's absolutely right. And so so we have these very different kinds of recognition scenes, right? So there's this yearning for home, this yearning for reunion, this yearning for coming back, right, all the way through. And then the recognition scenes kind of ring out changes on how that might look. There's the one by the scar where the old nurse recognizes his body. There's the recognition scene that comes through the shared knowledge about this bed. And then the recognition scene with the father comes through a different kind of means, again, though, through shared knowledge. So Odysseus' father, Laertes, doesn't really recognize him at first. And he says, well, if you really are my own son, this is really near the end of the book. He says, if you really are my own son, Odysseus, come home, show me a sign. Let me be sure. And Odysseus shows the scar, right? And that's not quite enough. So he does something more. He says, I'll tell you all the trees that grow in this orchard, which you gave to me. When I was little, I would follow you around the garden, asking all their names. We walked beneath the trees. You named them all and promised them to me. Ten apple trees and thirteen pear trees, forty figs and fifty grapevines. At that, Verity's heart and legs gave way. He recognized the signs as clear proof. So it's really interesting. It's a very different moment from the moment with Penelope, but there too, it's trees, right? And it's not one singular tree. It's like numbers. And it's like this many pear trees, this many apple trees, this many grapevines. Like it's very specific knowledge. It's very Caliban. It is. It is in some ways, right? There's this shared landscape, right? And this shared knowledge. But also like that that Caliban sense of ownership is yeah. being able to itemize everything in yeah. the land. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's absolutely right. So like, so it's this, I don't know how to put it. There's this shared past, right? That That is the guarantee that Odysseus is who he says he is, that causes that moment of recognition. But it's also like, like this, this shared landscape, right? Like this shared soil, this shared, like physical material landscape. And the reason that strikes me so forcibly is, you know, we've been talking about the Odyssey, or we've positioned it within a watery cluster, right? An oceanic cluster and water, which we haven't talked about yet, super important in here. Um, the waves, the shorelines comes up over and over again, but land is also really important. Um, and this is one of the moments, I think, you know, the, the, the tree moment where there's the bed that's built around the tree and even more so this orchard. There are these moments where like, the land, like the place where things grow is being really highlighted. And that is something you don't get in the Iliad at all. So it's a very different poem in that way as well. I'm thinking about now how we've talked about how in some of the other books that we've looked at, the ocean serves as a way of, yeah, as a mode of travel, but also as a mode of separation. And we absolutely see this here. The reason why Odysseus can have all these adventures in strange places is because they're separated mm-hmm, mm-hmm, into islands mm-hmm. and these islands are conceptually... They're different worlds. They're different worlds, mm-hmm. exactly. And one of the important things about them is that in many of these worlds, it's very important that Odysseus is not recognized 
right? And this he is... He can be a different person in every place almost. Yes. But this point is perhaps kind of obvious, but you know, home, the home that he's returning to is a place where he is recognized. And each of these places he goes on his travels, he's generally not recognized. So he's able to trick the Cyclops by claiming that his name is No Man. Mm -hmm. And he's able to live for a while when he reaches the island where Nausicaa is and where he is held for a day and asked to tell his, his great story eventually. It's because he's finally revealed himself, but he spends quite a while there sort of not known. He does want to be known everywhere he goes, it seems. Like, he has to tell the Cyclops. He has to tell... He gets asked for his name and asked who his people are over and over and over again. And um, usually he, ha- he, t- he doesn't tell the truth, right? He usually has another story. He's like, oh, I'm from Crete or I'm no man or whatever. Yeah, but then eventually he does tell. Eventually. Because he does want to be known everywhere. Because he does have the sense that every place should be kind of home for him eventually. Hmm. Where are you thinking of, like where he wants to be known? Well, I'm thinking about him telling the Cyclops at the end of it that he, oh, yeah. he reveals yeah. himself. He reveals yeah. himself Which is, to... in retrospect, a mistake. Oh, sure. <laughs> oh, sure. And and even when he he, he, tr- he makes a trip to visit the dead mm. and mm. The, in the ends of the earth, mm. and he sees his mother, mm-hmm. and he sort of avoids talking to her for a while, and then finally does try to talk with her, but like, there's a sense of like not engaging with who he is and then engaging with who he is. Yeah. That's really interesting. So that scene, it's in book 11 is super strange. He has to go see Tiresias in the world of the dead in order to get a prophecy to get guidance as to his next steps. Right. Um, and he makes an offering in spills blood. Right. And that's what will draw the shades to him. So he goes to the very ends of the world beyond the end of the ocean. And then he makes that offering in order to draw the shades in and he perceives his mother, but he needs to make sure she can't approach the blood first because he needs to wait for Tiresias to come. So Tiresias comes, he gets the prophecy he needs and so on. And then and only then does his mother approach. And then you have a kind of a strange recognition scene, right? And so, yeah. So this question of like when Odysseus makes himself known, it's like these weird tentative kinds of moments, um, that belated uh, announcement of his name to Polyphemus, to the Cyclops, right? Um, Which in retrospect was a mistake. Um, And then in the world of the dead. The other side of that that I'm thinking about is from the quote that you gave. Mm. When a man is far from home living abroad, there is no sweeter thing than his own native land and family. That there's a sense in which the feeling of home is something you feel when you're away from home. Yeah, absolutely. And what does that mean in terms of actually returning home? I mean, again, this feels like I'm going to end up in a fairly obvious point that you can never go home again. Mm. But it's interesting to think about how when he arrives back in Ithaca, of course, 20 years have passed. It's, 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 it's completely changed. changed. No, that's right. And even the people who have been there, even Penelope, having been there and waded through it, like, although that change has gone more slowly for her, and although she's able to take some comfort in reuniting with Odysseus when he gets back, there's still a sense of like, well, mm-hmm. things have changed. Well, that's it, right? It's because even when you come home, right, you're in the same place. You're in a different place in time. Right. That's exactly it. So you're in the same place and not the same place. And in some ways that's self evident, but it's also like really profound because it's with a pang you realize that every time, right? Whenever you go home, like you're not really where you used to be because you're different and it's different. And so I guess we could go even further and think about that sense of home as a place that is also polytropos, that is also ever changing, ever turning, ever becoming something else. I don't know. I feel like in the, that, I mean, yeah, like that might be true. In the Odyssey, though, I mean, aren't we being pushed in the opposite direction by things like the bedroom tree and so on? Like, isn't that, how can I put it, trying to be a kind of deeply symbolic guarantee that there is a place, there is a rootedness, there is a point of return? Like, I mean, I think you're absolutely right about that, that question of like, it's a it's an ongoing question. So many of the works that we've read already and that we're going to read together, you know, are trying to grapple with this. You know, is there a point of return? It, you know, where is home? Is it you know is it shifting? I feel like in the Odyssey, that one of the reasons that, that that bed tree thing is so powerful, I think, is it's kind of it's trying to say, yeah, it's rooted, it's right here. And if you're to think about it, like what is that saying? What it's saying is there's a lineage, there's a father, and there's a son. Right. I mean, I, th- I think that's what the bed is for. I mean, the bed, the bed is only like secondarily, I think, about the relationship of Penelope and Odysseus. It's about men. I mean, it's a very, like, it's a very man poem, right? In a lot of ways. Like, I mean, there are ways to read it against the grain and to unpack all kinds of interesting things about the female characters here. And we've talked about that, you know, both what, what, what's opened up as possibility within a figure like Penelope and also in figures like Circe and um, Calypso. 
that, that there's all kinds of possibility that's opened up there. And even in the abject figures of the slave women, there's like, there's things, there's ways to read the text against the grain and unpack that. But that said, I feel like, you know, I mean, like the Iliad, right? This is a poem that is fundamentally concerned with men and masculinity and warfare and power. And, you know, that's why the climax emotionally here, even though I don't think we feel it as the emotional climax, but I think it's meant to be a big emotional climax, is the reunion with his father. And the coming of age, the poem is about Odysseus, but it's also about Telemachus, right? It's about him becoming what he needs to become. And now that his father's home, he can become it. I mean, that's sort of the tidal thrust, so to speak, I think of this narrative in a lot of ways. And that's why it's not surprising that in book one, we see Telemachus with Athena, but he doesn't know that it's Athena. She's disguised herself um, as, as, a, as a man. And in the conversation that they have together, Athena gives him some advice. She says, you may find out news. Um, go to Pylos, question Nestor, then go to Sparta, visit Menelaus. She's giving all this advice about places that he ought to go. If you hear that your father is still alive, she says, and coming home, put up with this abuse for one more year. But if you hear that he is dead, go home and build a tomb for him and hold a lavish funeral and give your mother in marriage to a man. When this is done, she says, consider deeply how you might be able to kill the suitors in your halls, by tricks or openly. You must not stick to childhood. You are no longer just a little boy. Right? Dear boy, she says, I see how big and tall you are. Be brave and win yourself a lasting name. But I must go now. And Telemachus says, dear guest, you were so kind as to give me this fatherly advice. I will remember. So it's this really weird scene. It's like this fatherly advice scene. I mean, it's coming from Athena, right? Who's a goddess, but it's, it's manly advice, right? Kill the suitors by tricks or directly. Um, and he's like, I will remember. So it's in a weird kind of way, it's kind of setting the stage for the actual father-son encounter that's going to happen with Odysseus and Telemachus come together. Right. So, so that's what I mean by saying that it's a home that I think is deeply concerned with the fathers and sons in a way that I think is a little harder for us to notice because we are reading against the grain. We are looking for the other characters, which I think is really, really good. But we, we don't want to lose sight of, like I said, that kind of tidal thrust that is, is also deeply present. It's a weird book. So I mentioned earlier that I had first tried to read this book because I was putting a lot of energy when I was a younger man into reading James Joyce's Ulysses. Which I hope we'll do one day. I'm, I'm sure we will. But Ulysses, of course, is modeled on in, in various direct and indirect ways on the Odyssey. And there have been a lot of works that have been continuations, adaptations, imitations. An incredibly wide range of directions. Yeah. And people are still writing them. Just in the last several years, we've had Madeline Miller's Circe, mm -hmm, which is really interesting. Uh, Margaret Atwood's Penelope ad, and our friends over on another megaphonic podcast, Dear Reader, have talked about both Circe and the Penelope ad in previous episodes. So we'll have links to those, but you should definitely check them out. They have some lovely conversations about them. Yeah. There's Walcott's Omeros. Have you read that? No, I haven't. And I kept reading up on it, and I wasn't clear whether it's based on the Odyssey or the Iliad. It'd be neat to find an opportunity to talk about that work, though, because it's engaging with both of them in interesting kinds of ways. So that might be something we have to do in the future. But so many, like you said. And then there's also, um, in antiquity, right, like Virgil's Aeneid, which is something we might or might not talk about, which is really purposely doing all kinds of interesting stuff, both with the Iliad and the Odyssey. That might be a neat thing to pair with Walcott's Omeros, maybe. Perhaps, yeah. And then also other kinds of stuff, like also children's literature. I don't know if you run across the Percy Jackson books, right, which spawned some truly terrible movies. But the books, especially the early ones, like The Lightning Thief, they're actually very interesting. I mean, they're kids' books, but they're very readable by adults. And one of the things that's so interesting about them is they spend a lot of time talking about the gods as almost like human beings. Like, in a weird kind of way, those children's books are very faithful to the uh, view of the gods we get in the Iliad. Like, they're in a different level of being, but they interact periodically. And it's like, it's kid literature, and it's funny and stuff like that. But 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 it's got something right, especially the early books. And then even something like um, the Kubrick movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey, right? Like it's inviting you to think about, in what sense is this an odyssey? Well, absolutely. There are plenty of plenty of odysseys oh, that okay. don't necessarily directly approach. I mean, sadly, there's not a lot of Homeric echoes in Super Mario Odyssey. Fun, yeah. fun a game though that is. Yeah. Uh, and I, but uh, yeah, The Hobbit is another example that uh, Tolkien was apparently, drawing upon the Odyssey for some of that journeying. Well, that's the question. Like, if you're talking about journey narratives, right, there's a bunch of different templates for journey narratives. And the Odyssey, I think, is a sort of a subset of that, right? There's other ones like Exodus and stuff like that, right? Journey. There are different ways of conceptualizing journey. And, and the thing that makes an Odyssey 
well, there's a lot of things, but like one thing I think that's really super important makes an odyssey an odyssey is that it's a journey out, but it's also you get home, right? And that that's a very different thing. There and back again. Yeah. As as the Hobbit is subtitled. Yeah. yeah. So there's a there's a really compelling structure to this idea of a journey with lots of adventures along the way that makes it a natural fit for all sorts of storytelling. But there are also other aspects to the Odyssey, I think, that have made it compelling for people to write continuations of it. I mean, certainly with some of those more recent books, there are these sort of feminist approaches to it that you see in Circe and the Penelope Ed, taking a look at some of the female characters, the figure of Circe, who falls in love with Odysseus. Uh, the Penelope Ad, which Margaret Atwood takes a particular interest, not just in Penelope, but also in particular in the 12 slave girls who are killed mm-hmm. and, and really tries to think through, like, why did that happen? Give them some kind of stronger voice in the narrative. Yeah. One of the things I found really, really interesting about um, Miller and Circe, I mean, it's, I, th- I thought it was a really good book in itself, and I thought it was a really interesting engagement with the poem. It's clear that like Circe has her own narrative, like her own backstory, her like a, a really long history. And then it intersects. It's almost like two planes, right? It intersects with the plane of the Odyssey. And so um, Odysseus doesn't show up until like almost page 200. It's like page 198 in that book, right? And it's really neat because she notices the scar on him, but she has no idea what the backstory is. So it's like, it's like an anti-recognition scene. Like she sees the scar, but she can't read it, right? Because she doesn't know who he is. She doesn't know anything about him. So it's it, So there are all kinds of really subtle ways in which that book is it's not modeled after the Odyssey, right? It's it's a di- it's a story that parallels it or intersects with it, which I think is really creative. I like that. Both of them are finding characters whose stories could be told more fully, and then gives them a chance to do that. And in the case of Circe, it is particularly this understanding that the Odysseus moment is just a drop. It's just one small but important moment in Circe's life. And it's super important because her it's a, it's a relationship with Telemachus that's going to become really. Um, is going to go into surpri- in surprising new directions by the time we get to the end of the book, which I will not spoil. But but um, but the father son relation that we were teasing out in the um, Odyssey is clearly something that Miller is really interested in too. Well, that's one of the other ways in which some of these other texts that have used the Odyssey have looked at it. What happens after? Yeah, a lot of people aren't fully satisfied with this idea that Odysseus gets home and then that's it. We need more. Yeah. So so in the Inferno, <laughs> yeah. we have a fantastic encounter where we hear a bit more about what happened after Odysseus got home. Namely that he was unsatisfied and, and he went out. And he went out to to seek new worlds to conquer and swam out past the ocean and and died out there as went I recall. Too, went too yeah. far. Yeah. So he yeah, he's an exemplar of like how you should not try to push the boundaries too far. For Dante, and similarly in in Circe, once uh, once Odysseus returns, he's not satisfied. Like his talent, his skills are just wasted mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. in managing mm-hmm. Ithaca, mm-hmm. and he can't adapt back to that lifestyle. And instead of going off on, well, he does go off, I guess, on some further adventures, but mostly he just gets frustrated and resentful, which I think resonates as a, as as how we'd imagine yeah. <laughs> Odysseus would be when he got. Yeah, he needs Back. a puzzle, right? He needs a puzzle to solve at all times. Yeah. So, so yeah, obviously a lot of classical and canonical texts invite people to write another chapter and, and continue the story or, or rewrite the chapters that have already been written. But mm-hmm. I think there is something in the Odyssey that really encourages you to to think about it from other ways. And not because the Odyssey is, is lacking, in, the, in a sense. Like, it does feel psychologically satisfying, I suppose. Yeah, I think it's because that focus on creativity and, you know, craftiness, you know, um, the many turning mind, right? Like this quality of ingenuity, it encourages us to want more, to expect more because of the creativity that's that's implied in that, um, to solve a new problem, to deal with it, th- that there should be another horizon. To turn the story a few more times. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. I think that's why it's, um, I think that's maybe at least one reason why it's stimulated so many kinds of responses. And also, the other reason, I think maybe it's something you were talking about earlier, when you were talking about the islands, you know, when Odysseus tells his backstory, it's almost like there's all these other worlds. It's like, it's not science fiction, obviously, but there's a very science fiction-y fantasy kind of quality about those encounters, where you get a sense that you could have a whole other book about the Lotus Eaters, or about, you know, any one of these kinds of sites of encounter. Well, and in fact, uh, there was an early follow-up written by Lucian Mm. in the second century AD, uh, which is known as a true story, which I have not read, but it describes some of the further tales of Odysseus going again out beyond the pillars of Hercules and even going to the moon. Oh, that's so great. So 
It's it, awesome. So it is a book that has been read <laughs> as science fiction. Uh, so there's something to that idea. That's very fabulous. So this was the final book in our Watery Oceans cluster. And we've talked a little bit about how water plays out in the book, but I feel like this book actually took on a few other ideas about water that we hadn't seen in the previous books that we looked at. Yeah. Like for both To the Lighthouse and The Tempest, we ended up talking about time in connection with water. And that was really interesting like in terms of like how the tides are functioning or how the tempest season marks out a certain kind of annual cycle uh, or um, you know the sort of family time, the way in which water sort of plays a role in that for the Ramsey family into the lighthouse. And I found like, it seemed to me in the Odyssey, even though time is also really important, water is functioning in this really different kind of way, whereas you were saying it's um, it's sort of dividing and linking, like you travel on the water, but you also encounter these other, these other worlds, so to speak, in these different islands, right? But one of the things that struck me this time reading um, The Odyssey was how at one and the same time, there are moments when water and ocean seem absolutely immediately understandable. Like it's like, it's the ocean we know. It's just like things we've experienced. And there's this like feeling of recognition. And these other moments were like, this is another world. So I'm going to give two examples. One of them is this moment of like total recognition, or at least it struck me this way. So just after um, Odysseus has left Calypso, he's being sort of dashed in the water by the sea god Poseidon, who rouses a huge and dreadful wave, right? And Odysseus is trying to make it to shore. He dives into the sea and he drifts on the waves for two days and nights. And finally, he washes up on the shore. The waves grew big and hurled him at the craggy shore. His skin would have been ripped away and his bones smashed had not Athena given him a thought. He grabbed a rock as he was swept along with both hands and clung to it, groaning till the wave passed by. But then the swell rushed back and struck him hard and hurled him out to sea. As when an octopus dragged from its den has many pebbles sticking to its suckers, so his strong hands were skinned against the rocks. Um, And then he gradually finds his way onto the shore. His legs cramped up. The sea had broken him. This, his swollen body gushed brine from mouth and nostrils. There he lay, hardly fit to move. It's this long passage, but this whole sense of like your body being dashed on the rocks and not being able to to find your way out and the, the watery foam filling your mouth. Like, you know, if you've ever wiped out in the waves, right? You're like, you, this feeling is immediately, you know exactly what world we're in. So there's moments like that where you're like, oh, that's the ocean I know being submerged in. But there's also these moments where the ocean is like this super, super alien kind of place. I don't know if you, when you were reading this time, looked much at the passage where we get a description of um, Scylla and Charybdis. This is in book 12. It's the rock and the whirlpool. Yes, these two dangerous items on their on their voyage where you don't want to go too close to the whirlpool or you'll fall into it. Yeah. And you don't want to go too close to Scylla the sea monster because she will reach out and, with her many arms and grab your men. And, and in fact, these men do die in this. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Like, it's, it's a weird moment because, how can I put this? On the one hand, we read it as kind of natural phenomena, the rock, the whirlpool. Like, it's monstrous in the sense that the same way that the waves are like tentacles that drag you down, right? Scylla is on one side and the other side shining Charybdis with dreadful gurgling noise sucked down all the water. When she spewed it out, she seethed, churning like a boiling cauldron. The froth flew high, right? So it's natural phenomena, but it's also monstrous. Like it's also, I don't know what to say, personified. Like I found this passage, and this is in book 12, really uncanny because on the one hand, it's kind of natural things. Like we know what dangerous rocks are. We know what a whirlpool is, right? But here they're monsters. And I I found that really, I don't know, strange. Like it was familiar and alien. And the reason I guess I was thinking about that is because reading Wilson's translation, which I'd read parts of before, I'd never read it straight through until we were getting ready for today. One of the great things about it, I think, is that it's it's very accessible. It's very immediate. It's very visceral. Like you feel many of the moments in this translation as if it's your own world. Like you, you, you have a sense of familiarity. And that passage and it's not due to any feature of the translation. It's just this is this is how, this is the world of Homer's poem, right? Um, it's a world we kind of know, the rock and the whirlpool, and also this is a world where those are monsters. Like we don't quite like that's not quite our world, right? And so it's alien and familiar. I, I found that really striking this time. So the way that I was thinking about this text, approaching it from the perspective of water, sort of again goes back to that first line Mm. where I was thinking about the way of water as being something that is also many turning. Mm. Now, I don't know if that adjective is ever used to describe water in ancient Greek or modern Greek or any kind of Greek literature. I have no idea whether whether that's just something I'm reading as somebody reading it from a distance and, and just thinking with this mindset. 
But nevertheless, water does sort of keep turning. It is much traveled. A lot of the, a lot of the ways that water metaphorically works. It's all can water fit is in. always in action in here. That's yeah. something that very much struck me. It's it's always moving. Like it's the it's the waves or it's the foam or it's like there's there's it's ne- it's not still. Nor is Odysseus, of course. No. And similar to water, Odysseus seems to be able to pour himself into whatever shape is necessary. Yeah, he fits his container. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So he's able to fit mm-hmm. into any mm-hmm. situation very easily and very cleverly, as we might say. And so this idea of of this being a book about what that means, like not only thinking through this idea of cleverness, but also this, watery man. this idea of wateriness. <laughs> right. I wondered uh-huh, I wondered uh-huh, if that word uh-huh. had ever been translated to sort of pull out because because yeah. Wilson uses that translation complicated mm-hmm. for that idea, which is a perfectly good thing, but it is a very physical object idea of something because complicated yeah. often means folded Fold it into over. itself. Mm-hmm. That's the etymology of that word. Yeah. It's like what's a watery sense of complicated? Yeah. Yeah. One of the reasons I find that choice in the opening line, how she translates that complicated, one of the things I really liked about it is, you know, if if you ask me about something and I feel like I can't really explain it, I'll sometimes go, I'll say it's complicated. Right. Right. And and to say it's complicated is a way of saying I'm, I'm not going to explain that, or at least I'm not going to explain that yet. And that's exactly what's happening in this book, right? Like we we know there's stuff going on there, but we're only going to, in the fullness of time, understand what the motivations are, what's happening, what's making him the way he is. Well, as our watery oceanic summer comes to an end, mm. alas. <laughs> We're going to take on for our next cluster. Uh, uh, we're going to go in a, a different direction, I suppose. We're going to be looking at some philosophical novels. Appropriate for the start of the new academic year. Yeah, I suppose so. P- probably none of them are novels that you would immediately think of when tasked with name a philosophical novel. Yeah, but I think I think they're going to resonate with one another in really interesting ways. Oh, yeah. And they absolutely, I think, fit the criterion. So the first one we're going to be looking at is George Eliot's Middlemarch which is very exciting, I think. Uh, have you read this one before? I haven't. I've dipped into it and actually started reading it many years ago and and just stopped. Like It wasn't like I was like, this is awful. I don't want to read it anymore, but life got in the way somehow. So I'm actually really eager to talk about it together now. Yeah. It is a massive, massive book, of course, but it'll be interesting to talk about. And also, that's a really nice way for us to talk about something we've brought out in the past, but maybe not so recently. The idea that like, yeah, it's great when you read a book from beginning to end, but you know what? Sometimes you read parts of a book and that's also good. That's also fine, right? So we'll see what happens. I'm I'm curious to see what reading Middlemarch again looks like with the comfort of knowing what happens and therefore being able to quickly go over passages. Because there's definitely a real thrill in reading a novel or a text for the third, fourth, fifth time when you know when to go very fast and know when to slow down. And you can just read exactly, know when to slow down and really enjoy the parts that were pleasurable. Yeah. So after Middlemarch, we will be looking at a work that many of our listeners probably haven't heard of, which is a Big shame. But it's been getting more attention in the last little while. It's Im Tufail's Hai Im Yaktan, Alive, Son of Awake. Uh, it's a medieval work from the 12th century, hugely influential, um, partly known to Western readers because it lies behind Robinson Crusoe uh, by Defoe. But it's really fascinating in its own right. And I think it'll let us unfold some really neat ways in which philosophy and literature intersect. And the final work that we'll be looking at is Margaret Cavendish's The Blazing World. Yeah, that should be fun. Which I haven't read yet, but I've only heard fantastic things about. It is a 17th century novel about, like... Well, it's sort of science fiction-y. It's, I mean, we yeah. at one point we were talking about, if we wanted to read that work, where we would put it, what kind of cluster it would um, do best in. And we've been thinking about, like sort of proto-science fiction. But I think it's going to work really well here in thinking about, like, what is philosophy? What do we understand as philosophical literature? How do those disciplines intersect and how do they overlap, right? And I think this book is going to let us unfold that in a really idiosyncratic and neat way. And she's a wild figure, Cavendish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm super excited to finally have an excuse to sit down and read that. So, so uh, yeah, those are the books that we'll be doing in our next cluster. And I'm super excited about it. But in the meanwhile, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We would love to hear from you. Show notes with links for everything we've mentioned in this episode are at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 15. And The Spouter Inn is one of the many fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time. See you again at Spouter Inn.